Hi everyone, and thank you for coming to our special panel on social media and crisis communication. I am uh, Lucinda Austin, and this is Yan Chen, and uh, we are so glad that you could be here with us today. We have uh, four panelists, so this panel is going to be um, a little, I won't say longer, but it's going to be a little quicker, uh, so we can still fit into the, the time frame. So we're asking each of our panelists to talk for about 15 minutes. Um, I have a, a little timer that's going to ring, so if you hear that ringing, that'll be a, their, their pleasant reminder um, <laughs> that they need to be wrapping up their presentation, and we have uh, we have beautiful five. <laughs> yeah, so five, five minutes left, one minute left, um, to try to keep us on track because we do have four, uh, four presenters. Um, after each presenter, we're going to allow a little bit of time for a quick question or two that you may have, so we're going to limit that actually to two questions. And then if we have time at the end, we'll open it up and you can ask questions of any panelists at that time. But we want to make sure we have time to get through all four of these really great papers. Um, for this panel, this was a special call um, for a book that Yan and I have coming out through Rutledge. Um, and the book is tentatively titled right now, Social Media and Crisis Communication. So these four papers that were chosen are going to be included as part of that volume. Uh, and we are excited for that to come out uh, next year. If you have questions about that book, you can talk to Yann or I uh, later. We, are, we just finished our call for chapters, but we are still considering others. So if you have a burning um, desire to be in that book or a topic that you think is relevant, you can come and talk to us um, about that. Uh, but our panelists today, we're going to introduce them to you quickly and, um, and then let them get started on their great papers. Um, our first um, presenter will be um, Tim Coombs, and his paper is titled Social Media's Value in Crisis, Channel Effect or Stealing Thunder. Um, and then our second will be Oyvind Island, uh, Digital Dialogue, Crisis Communication, and Social Media. Mm -hmm. And the third presenter will be Flora Hong. Uh, title will be Ethical Social Media Engagement in Time of Crisis. And our fourth presentation will be presented by two wonderful students from Nanyang Technology University, um, a corporate social media spokesperson who should speak on behalf of the organization in times of crisis. Thank you so much. And uh, Tim, if you'd like to get us started. Yeah. I think everyone can hear me. Or do we need the microphone? <laughs> I can hear you, but I'm in the second row. So. Okay. So is, it, is the microphone on? Okay, so this one's working? All right. I want to start off with a driving question when we're talking about crisis communication. And whether you're on the academic side or you're over on the practitioner side, the question is, what makes for an effective message during a crisis situation? Unfortunately, there's no simple answer. Instead, what we find, it's a really complex puzzle with a lot of pieces. And in fact, we don't even know where all those pieces are or how they fit together. And that's where research comes in. I think that's what we provide from the academic side, is we help to find those pieces and explain how those pieces fit together. Well, one of those pieces that we know exists and works is the idea of stealing thunder. And stealing thunder is basically when there's a crisis situation and your organization knows you're in a crisis, you are the first source to release that information. So your stakeholders learn about the crisis from you, the organization, not from the news media and not from some post up on social media. It comes from you directly. You're the initial source. And we know that helps an organization. It protects it from a lot of the damage that they might incur from a crisis. Well, add to that now the emergence of social media. And what we have is our puzzle gets even more complex because there are issues that arise in just the use of the social media. And one of those tentative findings and another possible piece is the idea that there's a channel effect. That by using social media, that changes how stakeholders actually perceive your crisis message. But one of the concerns we had when looking at some of that research was that perhaps there's some confusion between the source, which would be timing and sealing thunder, and the channel effect, that there could be some issue there. And so what I'd like to do is walk you through the study we've begun to explore that issue with and take you through some of the basic ideas behind it, the design, and then focus on the results. One of the driving issues here is the idea of what about a channel effect? Is there really a channel effect or not? Is that the research there is still tentative. And the reason it's tentative are two reasons. 
And the first reason is the studies, as they've been conducted so far, have not controlled for timing. That when you're using social media, source and channel can get conflated with one another. Because if it's on my company Facebook page, and that's the message you see, I'm also the first source for you. So it cannot just be channel, it could also be source. So we're trying to sort that out. Plus, Twitter complicates everything when you're talking about it from a research perspective. It's 140 characters. So it's not comparable to compare Facebook to a news story to a Facebook page because of the number of characters and the size of the of the um, messages that are being used. And that's uh, a design issue that's too boring to get into, but just know that's really problematic as well. And so what we've done in the study is we can distill it down to this. It's stealing thunder, and that's Thor over there. That's the best representation of thunder I could and lightning I could come up with. And also versus social media. So is it a source or is it a channel effect that we're looking at here? And what we've done is we came up with six hypotheses. I'm not going to run through them. They're long. Hypotheses are boring. What I will say is there are three related to a channel effect and three related to stealing thunder and it relates to three outcome variables which we'll come to later. We'll get through those. So kind of give you the basics of the design here. And think of it, we're thinking about solving a puzzle here. Don't think of it as an, an empirical study. I know for some of you that's scary, but we're going to look at it as a puzzle instead what we're looking at here. The design was a three by two. And what, and the conditions there, but it's an incomplete factorial design. In a complete factorial design, there would be six cells, but in this one we only have five. That's why it's incomplete. There were 152 respondents, and these were adults from across the United States. They came through a survey monkey, and they have a system where you can actually get respondents through them. 77, 76% of them were over the age of 30. The point is, this was not a student sample that we were using. And we, for our stimuli, what we did is we had three channels. We had a Facebook post, we had a Twitter post, and we had an online news story. And we had two different sources. The source, one source was CNN, and the other source was, um, was the organization in crisis, Taylor Foods. Obviously, Taylor Foods does not have an online news channel like CNN, so that's why there are only five channels. That's why it's an incomplete design. It made no sense for Taylor Farms to have an online news story. And what I'll do is I, I want to show you a few of what the, the stimuli look like here. And it was a crisis type was a product harm. And we chose product harm because product harm creates moderate amounts of perceptions of crisis responsibility. So it's not too harsh, but it's not too low. And in fact, the previous studies looking at the channel effects had used a similar type of crisis as well. So if we look a little bit at the messages here, this was the Taylor Farms site. What we did is Taylor Farms had a product recall. We made sure none of our subjects had heard of this recall. It was about four or five years back. And so we used the actual message from the recall, and then we, we put it in. In this case, it's the Facebook page for Taylor Farms. We use elements of their Facebook page, cut and paste, you put it together, and you kind of get what looks like the actual Facebook message there. CNN, this is their news story. It's the exact same text. All we're changing is the sources. That's it. So the text remained the same in the Facebook post for CNN, for Taylor Farms, and also for the online. So they were completely equivalent in terms of how they were approached. Again, the only difference was the source for the information and what channel that it appeared in for those. For Twitter, we could only compare between Twitter, and the Twitter was the same message whether it was CNN or from Taylor Farms. Again, just who was the source that was delivering that message that was coming out. In terms of the results, we used a MANOVA analysis to get at the data analysis. And what we had, just as a background, we did some manipulation checks for the channel and the source. Those were strong. We looked at the right reliabilities for our three outcome variables. We looked at crisis reputation. We looked at uh, perceptions of crisis responsibility. And we also looked at what was called the secondary crisis reaction as well. Again, to be consistent with the earlier source studies, we used these. Reliabilities were strong, so we, we ran, went ahead, we ran the NOVA analysis. There was no interaction effects, and that's a good thing, because that means we could go right and look at the main effects for, the, for channel and source. There was going to be no uh, complicating factors from interaction. On the channel side, for the three outcome variables, reputation, crisis responsibility, and secondary crisis reaction, there was no effect. We found no channel effect when we controlled for source. And, and the source effect for 
two of the three hypotheses, we did find confirmation that there was actually a source effect where stealing thunder was occurring. And that was for reputation and crisis responsibility. We didn't find one for the secondary crisis reaction. But that's not too surprising because secondary crisis reactions are when people go and post comments online. And for that, you need to have stronger emotion about the crisis. And this just didn't generate that much emotion because it was a moderate level of crisis responsibility. A more severe crisis, you might see more of a secondary crisis effect. People just weren't that excited about going and posting messages about a recall of a bag of lettuce. It just <laughs> didn't have that same emotional impact for them. And to look at a little bit more closely at the details, I just wanted to give you a few numbers, not many. As you can see, the reputation was lower when it was from the news source as opposed to the organization in crisis. That's stealing thunder. Similarly, crisis responsibility was much higher when it was the news source versus the organization in crisis coming directly from Taylor Farms. Once again, reflecting stealing thunder and the idea that there is a source effect rather than a channel effect going on here. So in conclusion, uh, we would like to argue that the results consistently support the idea of stealing thunder. And we really didn't find much support for the idea that there was a channel effect that was occurring in this situation. And we would argue, though, that there is a strong benefit to using social media during a crisis. And it's going to be driven by stealing thunder. If you think about it in this way, that if I'm a stakeholder and I follow an organization, I follow your organization on Twitter, I follow it on Facebook, I'm more likely to encounter the crisis on your social media than in the news media, even if you release it, si relate it, release it simultaneously. And that's because I'm following you. I'm attending to your social media. I'm probably not looking for all these news stories about you, so I will probably miss it. And a good example of that is recall information. It's usually buried fairly deep in the media. People don't see it. And as a result, if companies use social media to talk about their crises, and I'm going to use recalls as an example of that because we've done some other research that shows in the U.S. only about 50% of the companies ever mention their product recall in their social media. That you're missing out on a good chance to steal thunder and to benefit your organization for it. And so, you know, we would argue that the benefits in the earlier studies that were found were actually not a channel effect but a source effect. However, this story isn't the end point of it. As I said, this is one more piece in a fairly complex puzzle. And if we look at other crisis types, we might find that there could be some type of channel effect in that situation. And what we need is more research in the area of social media to get more pieces of the puzzle. And what you're going to hear after me today are more pieces to that puzzle. Thank you. Did you identify, sorry, did you identify specific companies that were able to do this, uh, stealing thunder? You said only about 50% of U.S. companies uh, uh, mention their recall in the web on their social media Yeah, And uh, oddly enough, it was usually more larger companies, smaller food companies, who actually would then proclaim that they were really concerned about the health benefits of their products, rarely talked about their recalls. It was mostly the larger food companies that talked about their recalls. And my school must have uh, come to you for advice, because when we had a pretty serious uh, crisis, we mentioned it first, before the media got a hold of it, and within a few days, the crisis was over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really the, that's the power of stealing thunder. It makes it go away. It's just, it's just not it's just not interesting to anyone. Even the news media is not that interested in it anymore. <coughs> Thank you. So do you yes. think that uh, do you think that this um, stealing, stealing thunder works for a certain type of crisis like product harm, but not for other types of crisis like uh, financial misappropriation or scandals? Other sorts. Yeah, that's a that's a good question because it has been taught. It hasn't been actually tested across an array of them, but there there might be some benefit to them as well. The problem is those types of crises. You know, as as you mentioned, those are going to spike things up really high, so that it might not there might not be enough of a benefit from the stealing thunder in a really bad situation. But there might be. I mean, it's hard to say that we we need to test it across a stronger set. But I think. Uh, some of the research suggests it should work even in the higher ones. There's been some that have been more in the high category and they've actually seen the benefit from that. It's just something about releasing that bad information first really really benefits you. <laughs> actually, it does you less harm. But. 
Do you think the social media will take the place of the company's website in the future? Uh, I think the social media should complement the website. I think the social media should be a way to drive people into the website because the social media has limitations, particularly Twitter has the limitations, and Facebook is a little bit different too so because it has a more informal tone. I think they need to work together, and that way I can have links to drive you to the website. I think you're always going to need the website for more information for, for organizations, but social media needs to be part of that mix, and if it's not, the company is, is missing a big opportunity there. So I think they'll, in the future they should all work together better than they do now. What if it's a scandal involving a CEO or something? Should mm -hmm. he release himself something? Or oh. should it be like a corporate message? <laughs> Oh, that, that, that's, that's, a good that's a good question. Uh, it probably would still have to come, it, you would need to be a statement by the CEO on behalf of the corporation. So I think a, a corporation, I don't think, should release it without the man or the woman's name associated with it. I think it's problematic if they don't, because then are you, are you really taking yeah, what I'm talking about? What I mean is, should it be like a quote from him, like saying you know, something more personal than, than, uh, rather than a generic message? Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I cheated on my wife, <laughs> the president, rather than, oh, the president of the United States, I, you know. <laughs> That's a good question to test. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Which of the strategies would work better for them? But that's a testable question. That.